let us pray together. Our Father, it is because you are our Father that you opened our eyes and you opened our ears to the secrets of the kingdom. We know that our lives are blessed as you blessed Abraham by revealing yourself to him, being his shepherd, being his teacher, being the one who is for him, and you are for us, all the creation under your power, under your authority, is for us. And this evening, as we begin to study the atonement, which you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, arranged before the creation of the world to make satisfaction for sin, to reconcile God to us. May you be our teacher. May you lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. And may we realize what a blessing your grace and your mercy has been and continues to be in our life and will be forevermore. We pray for your blessing upon our fellowship. We thank you for this delicious food. We thank you for Benjamin and Marisal and Jerry and Josiah. We're so blessed by them and strengthened by them. We pray for your blessing upon them as they continue to bless so many people. And so we commend, we rely on you to be our teacher this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you all have a copy of the materials? Everybody is okay? All right. And so, tonight we are going to begin a lesson isn't that a nice slide? Is it? I just was tired of the old background and I decided to get another one. And so this is really a pretest that I have for you. And so I don't know what this is going to sound like when people listen to us because I'm going to ask each of you to write down your definition of atonement. You have to write it, okay? Don't say, I know what it is. You have to write, what do you understand atonement to be? Because we need to be on the same page. And if you don't have a pen, I understand the Republican caucus borrowed our pens. And uh, I think they're going to be returned. <laughs> anyway, if you don't have a pen, I am helpless. There are no pens in the uh, office that I know of. So if you don't have a pen, I am sorry. That's all I can say. <laughs> Maybe you can crawl out of having to write what a tone is. A uh, crystal. Um, we may have borrowed your limited pens <laughs> for the senior saint supper on Wednesday. And the senior citizens took them home. Maybe. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to lay the blame on anyone. <laughs> the truth is, we don't have pens. <laughs> what? is atonement. I'm not talking about limited, I'm just talking about atonement. And if you have your cell phone here, it's not fair to type it in and say, what is atonement? What is your understanding 
of atonement. Atonement. Anybody want to give us their definition? This is a class, okay? <laughs> if you knew everything, then you wouldn't have to be here. No, you should be here because then you can share your knowledge with the rest of us. What is atonement? What is one aspect of atonement? Well, I'll make it easier. What's the base word of atonement? <laughs> and everybody said, atonement. <laughs> if you atone for something, what do you do? Pay for it. You pay for it. Does your definition have that kind of a description? Atonement really means to cover. That's what it means. Today, if you went to McDonald's, which I haven't been to for years, really, I understand a Big Mac is that about 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just say it is. And you are there, and then somebody comes up to you, and they say to you, I'm giving you $20 to cover the cost of your Big Mac. Would that be atonement? Would it? Yes, because you have a debt, and someone else is going to pay your debt. In the Old Testament, atonement meant two additional things, but still it's related to cover. One of them means to take away. And so if you are at McDonald's and you've got this $20 bill to pay and then somebody gives you that $20, then they have taken away your debt. It can also mean in the Old Testament to purify. And so purify also means, you know, to cleanse. It has the whole idea of taking away. So all of those things put together have an idea of what atonement means. Oh. What causes the need for atonement? Ended. Our sins. Who agrees with this young man? Terrific answer. Atonement has to do with sin, or there is also uncleanness, defilement, that would require atonement. My next question. What does limited atonement limit? Paid. The number of debts that can be paid? Or that will be? Who agrees with this fine young man? Who smells a rat? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have a better answer. 
Dan, I see your hand up. Or are you were just. I'm going to say the number of debtors that can be atoned. It limits the number of debtors. Who agrees with that, young man? Verla. Well, yeah, it limits it to those that God has chosen before the great world. So the atonement is limited to those whom God chose. Who agrees with that? So then you have to agree with Dan also. There's a limited number of Jeffers. God has chosen. What you said, Kaden, I'm happy you said it. Because that's the accusation against limited atonement. Well, Mom can vouch for what I really <coughs> meant, but... I asked him, I said, so like, only some of my sins? He's like, no, the number of people, so... Yeah. Okay. He... So you're in our I'm same not, boat. Not, we're all circle, together. I just didn't explain it right. Yeah. No problem, <laughs> No problem. All right. That's just to get your feet wet in, in what we're doing. See, God does not sweep under the rug your and my sins. They must be dealt with. Why? Is your hand up, Rich, or you're just... No, what was the question? I missed it. <laughs> the question. Why can God not sweep our sins under the rug? You children know what that means? Sweep under the rug. It used to be rugs. Maybe you still have one that is an area rug, and then you're getting company, and then you just sweep the dirt <laughs> under the rug. It's still there. God does not sweep our sins under the rug. Why not, Cole? Because he's a just God. What do you mean by that? Um, his law demands justice, and something must be done for all of our sins. Who agrees with Cole? God is just. Sin must be dealt with. Thank you, Cole. All right. So what is atonement? We're going to have our famous reading. We're going to go through this. Ms. Cora. Throughout church history, there have been various reasons to understand the nature of Christ's atonement. Do you know any of the theories of atonement? We're going to look at some of them. Abby. Each of the first four has some truth in them, but not the complete truth of these other. I'm going to show you five theories on the atonement. And you're going to say, well, that does have some truth in it. Some of that is correct. And so the question is going to be, uh, what, what happened on the cross? Okay? And so the first one is this one, the ransom theory. What does ransom mean to you? Something needs to be paid. I suppose you're the most familiar, at least I am, and I always assume I'm not different than most people. But ransom, if somebody was kidnapped, and you have to pay a ransom. This theory, well, here it is. I guess I got too much of it here. Sorry about that. 
Would you read this part of it, Josie? It regards Christ's atonement as accomplishing a victory over the cosmic forces of sin, death, evil, and Satan. What that means is, this theory says Satan has held humanity captive to sin. Are you okay with that? Sound good to you? Or do you smell a rat? This theory means to rescue humanity, God had to ransom sinners from the power of Satan by delivering Jesus over to Satan as an exchange for the souls held captive. Are you following me? <coughs> Does that fit in with your theology? What's the problem? It doesn't have you got it. <laughs> I was just gonna say the only power Satan has over us is what God allows him to have. God is still the one who owns our souls. Who agrees with Satan? You should hold your hand up high. The ransom theory gives more power to Satan than he has. You said it well. Satan has no power other than what God gives him. Where do we learn that in Scripture? Indeed. Job. Thank you. All that Satan has ever done, he has done. Because God is giving people over to disobedience. <coughs> he does not have power over those whom God has chosen. <coughs> He's never, Satan has never in, been in a position that he can make demands from God. Satan cannot come up to God and says, well, I will give them back to you if I can have Jesus killed. There is a theology that you're going to bump into today. But that is not correct. This verse is a verse that is used to defend the ransom theory. John, did you read it? Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Who is the ransom paid to? God. You all agree with that? You're right. The ransom is paid to God. Jesus came to save us from God's wrath. God's judgment on sin. Here is a verse that we take to defend our position, Verla. Romans 5, verse 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
We are saved from the wrath of God. It's the ransom paid to God. God takes the offering of Christ. You know, people talk about, you know, God offers us salvation. That's not true. The only offer in salvation is the offering of Christ to God. And God received his offering. And how do we know that God received his offering? John. He raised him from the dead. Raised him from the dead. The wages of sin is death. If sin is paid for, then death no longer has hold of us. That's the ransom theory. There's another one called satisfaction theory. John, did you read this for us? Boy. And some. Category the satisfaction theory supports the idea that Christ's death made a satisfaction to the Father to restore his wounded honor rather than appeasement of his righteous wrath. Let that sink in. Why is it called the satisfaction theory? What does it satisfy? This theory is focused on that God's honor has been ruined, has been broken. And so the purpose of Christ's atonement is to restore God's honor. Is that what it's for? I want to remind you, all of these have some truth to them. But they do not encompass our understanding of the atonement. It is more than that because it says right in here, God's righteous wrath against sin has to be appeased, has to be satisfied. And so there is a sense in which the atonement satisfies God, but not just his honor, it satisfies his whole wrath. That's what that is for. We have a verse here that will help us. And would you read Romans 3, 23? For all the sin and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> and so we fall short of that. We have all sinned. And so there is that aspect. But there is also this part, and that will be read by Isabella. Um. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So our problem with the satisfaction theory is that it does not deal with the wrath of God on us for our sin. God's honor, yes. But there is also God's wrath. So it's an inadequate theory. Christ vindicates the righteousness of, of God by becoming our substitute. 
Here is another one, the moral influence theory. And this one will be read by Joyce in you ever you are ready. Christ's atonement was no more than a beautiful example of sacrificial Christian love and behavior. You're probably familiar with that. That, you know, Christ was just such a wonderful example. There's no greater love than what Christ had. He sacrifices himself, and so he's our wonderful example for how we are to live together. Is there some truth to that? I won't call you a heretic. <laughs> yes, there's some truth to that. But again, this does not go far enough. What's missing when you limit the atonement to just Christ's example? Okay. Doesn't satisfy God's justice. Who agrees with Cain? That is wonderful. John 15, 12 is the verse that the moral influence theory is one of the verses that they stand on. Deb? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so they're seeing Christ's atonement as the so wonderful sacrificial love. And so that is what we need to copy. We need to do that. And so when we're saying that, that if this is what we say is just uh, an example, then we're saying that God had no obstacles to restore sinners to fellowship with himself. All of this sin in our life out of that anger in his life, he's all, oh, forget it, I'm just going to have love. And so, we have Romans 5.10, Rich. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. <coughs> What does it mean that we are reconciled? David. Made right with God. You are correct. <coughs> if you and I have a conflict, then we meet together and we make it right. We seek for reconciliation. And so, there is more to the atonement than just an example of the love that we have to have for each other. Christ's death, his atonement, paid for our sins, and it appeased the holy wrath of God. There's another one called the government theory. Is it big enough? Can you see it? There's a little bit more on this slide. And we will have, I think it is Mariah's turn to read. God chose to punish Christ in order to maintain the moral order and government of the universe. Sound good to you? What do you think it means to maintain the moral order and government? Dan. That would mean that it is 
actually good to begin with, and he's only going to keep hold it there, when in fact he's actually restoring it back to where it should have been, where it was before, before sin. You agree with Dan? This theory, you said it well, Dan. I want to say thank you to you. They're, if they're just saying, well, what the atonement is showing is that when there is wrongdoing, that wrongdoer must be punished to maintain the moral order. I think all of us have that in the back of our head when we have these no bail policies which have come in and we're not maintaining a moral order. And so the government theory is saying, well, God chose to punish Christ to maintain the moral order. And so when you and I understand that Christ had to suffer for my sins, then hopefully uh, that's going to stop me from sinning. And that's the purpose of the atonement, is to keep me on, we call that the straight and narrow. Are you okay with the moral theory? Question. So is that like being scared straight? Say that one more time. Is that like being scared straight? You know? Scared straight, you yeah. said? Yeah. yeah well, I, mean, I think it people, works. Do these people think then that you get to a point where you don't sin? Oh, I see. So you keep, you get to the point you're no longer sinning because you are so uh, disciplined by the knowledge of Christ's suffering for you. Want to respond to that? I think there is that final result will come from that. You and I reject this theory because what does it not accomplish? In your definition of the atonement, it does not satisfy God's justice. We have this large passage. It is your turn, Paul. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, merciful, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children, to the third and the fourth generation. Thank you, Cole. There is a merciful and gracious God that keeps his steadfast love. He's forgiving. We will continue reading. Uh, I mean, that, that is the one that we want to keep that. The last one is the penal substitution theory. And it is this description, Ed. In his death, Christ paid the penalty that our sins incurred by suffering vicariously in our place as our substitute. You like that one? Christ paid the penalty that our sins incurred. <coughs> Suffering vicariously in our place is what that means, as our substitute. That's the atonement. That is the definition that covers all the bases. We will have this read, Dan, 
leads. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There is a perfect description of the atonement. Isaiah 53. Here is another one. Amen. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There you have it again. He took our sin that we become righteous. One more. Kelly. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. There is another perfect description <clears throat> of the atonement. And we have another one. And then, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every aspect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make proportion, propitiation for the sins of the people. Thank you very much. Each of these descriptions has some truth in it. They are not exclusive. But the ransom was paid to God. There is a ransom. It's not paid to Satan. Christ's atonement satisfied God's wounded honor, but it also satisfied his righteous anger. Don't worry about my poem, okay? You won't bother anybody. The cross is a moral example of Christian love, that's true, but it's much more than an example. The atonement is also an instance of God's moral governance of the universe, but it is also much more than that. So I found these things interesting, and I thought you would find them interesting as well. All right. The doctrine of limited atonement gets to the heart of the gospel. I have this simple question. Is the gospel for everyone? I'll give you a verse to read and Tim, is it your turn? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek. Thank you, Tim. Who is the gospel for? Everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. And who is going to believe? The elect. The gospel is for them. All right. Question number one. These are on your paper, I think. Would you read the first? Yes, Kelly. I have a question, and maybe you'll get to it in this talk, but I have a friend who believes that... Um, Yes, salvation is for those that God chose before the creation of the world. But then everybody else is given free will. And so there are some that can, the rest of, the, who have not been chosen by God, still have a chance to be saved if they choose themselves. I think that's how she said it. Did you all hear Kelly? How would you answer Kelly? She says, uh, she has a friend, and this friend believes in the elect. And they will be saved. She believes the rest who are not elected have a free will. And they 
may have an opportunity to be saved if they choose for Christ. Am I saying that correctly, Kelly? Yeah, she said, I think that maybe it was John Wesley's mom believed that. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Anybody want to respond to that? Verla? We're dead in our sins and dead men can't respond. We are dead in our sins. We cannot respond. That's a very good answer. And I am not a person who believes in a free will. I, I can't believe that. Adam and Eve were created with a free will. They could sin and they could not sin. The tree in the garden of the knowledge of good and evil was the test. Are you going to obey God? Or are you going to obey yourself? The tree needed to be there. I know when I was a kid, I thought, well, God, if they're not allowed to eat of it, why do you put it there? It's just like your mom children making these delicious lumpias and then she puts them in the middle of the table and she says now don't touch them don't eat it doesn't make any sense unless your mom is testing your obedience Adam and Eve had a free will what happened to their free will when they sinned They lost. A free will means that I am free not to sin. We cannot not sin. Our wills are corrupt. And our wills must be changed by God. If people have a free will, then they are able not to sin. Our wills are controlled by sin. Paul talks about that in Romans 7, the good I would, I don't, the evil I would not, that I practice. Because we don't have a free will. That's where I stand. Does limited atonement mean that there is a limit placed upon the value or merit of the atonement of Jesus Christ? And everybody said, very quiet, no. <laughs> there is no limit on the value or the merit of the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. If, if Christ had, you know, if God had elected more people, then would Christ have had to suffer more? No. 
He paid the penalty for sin. B. I don't know who it is to read. Is it your turn, Crystal? Does the Lord of Atonement confess that Christ's atonement is sufficient to atone for the sins of the whole world? And everybody said loudly and clearly? Yes. 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 You're in the right ballpark. Thank you very, very much. C. Latasha. Oh, I'm sorry. Just let me say that's why I made Confess that it has always been God's will to limit the effectiveness of Christ only those whom he has chosen from eternity and given to Christ. Thank you, Latasha. That's a long sentence. It has always been God's will to limit the effectiveness of Christ's atonement to only those whom he had chosen from eternity and given to Christ. And everybody said? Yes. Did I hear no? What's wrong with it? Has it always been God's will to limit the effectiveness of Christ's atonement to only those whom He has chosen? Paid. It doesn't limit it. It doesn't limit the effectiveness. It fulfills the plan. Then I need to define effectiveness. Thank you. That's why I love teaching. Effectiveness means it is going to work in the heart, in the mind, in the soul of those whom God chose and gave to Christ. The atonement is not working, is not effective in those whom God has not chosen. I want to say this is yes. Uh, the reason I say this, John 17, 9, I am praying for those whom you have given me. I am not praying for the world. Jesus Christ is not trying to save everybody in the world. He is saved effectively. That's John 17, 9. He is saving effectively all of those that the Father has given him. And that's why I think amazing grace becomes amazing grace when you understand that not everyone receives God's grace. God, you saved me. The atonement of Christ applies to me. My sins have been placed on Christ. He bore my sins. Are you okay with this being a yes? Ed. What does it mean then when, when the Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish? That is an excellent question. There is that verse. I think it's in Peter, but I'm not sure. Maybe Timothy. God is not willing that any should perish. And then you read a little farther that he talks about those who will believe. And so he's not willing that any of those who belong to him will perish. He's not speaking to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world. Does that help you? 
It is the it's seven twenty. Is it time to stop? I love teaching you because we're going to begin that true and false on the evening of Resurrection Sunday. All right. Thank you, everyone. And did that calendar get passed to run? Does it have dates on it? Are they all filled in? They're all filled in. Who's serving on the third? The Vanderbilt. Who's on the tenth? Lafayette and Latasha. And who's serving on the 17th? Andy. Okay, and who's serving on the 31st? Joyce and I. All right, that's wonderful. I really love teaching you, and may God bless you all as you continue to attend here. Next Sunday night, it's 6 o'clock. Uh, the, the gospel singers are going to be in uh, Ebenezer. And then the next week, the next weeks we'll be looking at DVDs. Dan, are you going to, to run that show? Sure. You're qualified, you and, and uh, Benjamin, or Caden. Yeah, I'll, I'll get all the tech stuff I need for that. So we'll be that's, that's one. I really enjoy you people. You coming out is just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Father, this atonement of Christ, as we think about it, as we look into it deeply, we're so moved that it's your work. You give Christ, your only begotten Son, and you laid on him our sins and you crushed him you pierced him for our iniquity and so the judgment that you placed upon him brought us peace that is our confession of praise and thanks may our lives reflect that peace, that joy, that wonderful blessing. May you bless us all as we part, as we take our, up our work again tomorrow. May you bless us until we return together. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again, everybody.